so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much to the organizing committee for the invitation to speak. What I want to start off with is uh, just talk a little bit about our actual clinical case. We have the emergency and regular medical service about 18 months ago. Uh, we were called to assist our colleagues in the Midlands uh, with a patient who early in the morning had uh, sort of oversteered going around the bad bend on some black ice. Um, and you can see he's crashed through a concrete wall here, which is completely dem demolished. Um, and if you can imagine that the uh, initial vectors for this mechanism were that the car uh, skewed 90 degrees, uh, so this impacts all um, on the driver's side uh, where he was, and then he's traveled on about 10 or 12 meters into this field, uh, the car rotating another uh, 90 degrees, so it's actually 180 degrees from the direction of travel. He's complaining of severe pain in his right hip, and sort of ominously for us, he says that he thinks it's broken. Uh, it took us about 40 minutes to get him uh, extricated from the car safely. Uh, big ups to the crews from the Midlands, from Ballinslow and Athlone, and also Galway County Fire Service did an excellent job getting us uh, this guy out of the car. Um, but uh, what you can see there, he's had pretty much all the analgesia uh, that they can give him, and he's still in extreme pain. Um, I think this kind of nicely illustrates, this is just a snapshot from our, from our monitoring uh, that we had for the 30 minutes or so that the patient was with us in the helicopter. Um, and uh, so honestly there you can see that his tachycardia is increasing um, and as well his mean arterial pressure is starting to decrease as well. Sorry. Um, so why is this guy bleeding? Well, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not rocket science. I'm here talking about pelvic splints and pelvic injuries. Um, and as you can see, the pelvis is a very vascular uh, structure. And so any damage to any of these bones here is going to result in uh, the potential for um, uh, shearing of some of these uh, veins and arteries. The arteries we don't worry about too much. The majority of these uh, significant bleeds are actually venous in nature. Um, and. Uh, it is a very uh, sort of predictable pattern of injury. Uh, so in other words, if you know the mechanism, if you're fairly uh, au fait with the mechanism of injury, uh, you can see your sort of typical anterior uh, posterior compressions, your lateral compressions from your side on impacts, and uh, obviously your vertical shear. I have to apologize here for the uh, um, uh, prudishness of my spell checker. This should of course be pubic synthesis um, and pubic brain uh, But the thing to take on from that is that anterior lesions bleed anteriorly and posterior lesions bleed posteriorly into the retro peritoneum. Uh, there is a fracture classification for all the trauma surgeons out there um, for these open book pelvic fractures. Uh, but the big take home I want to, uh, to give you from this is that the actual extent of injury or extent of disruption has absolutely no correlation with the amount of hemorrhage. So you can have somebody who has a sort of fairly horrific looking AP3 fracture here, um, and they might be outbled by somebody who has a, a sort of fairly simple um, uh, lateral compression fracture. Uh, so don't think that just because the amount of disruption is, is uh, fairly non-existent that the uh, potential for hemorrhage isn't there. So what did we bring to the table with this patient? Well, we had a health explained to us in our bag, and once he was extricated from the car, we were able to apply this. Um, as you can see, if you, if you think back to the slide I showed you of the trend monitoring, we didn't slow down or prevent his hemorrhage, or sorry, we didn't prevent his hemorrhage, but we did slow it down uh, somewhat. Um, and really, uh, you can kind of disregard the first three points on this slide. Um, you know, the actual idea of bringing the pelvis back into alignment is a sort of a nice side effect, but it's not the real reason that we're applying this splint. What we want to get this splint on to do is to prevent um, significant hemorrhage. Um, so it's really getting back to your CABC approach. Um, and what I want you to think is that this catastrophic hemorrhage um, has got to be bound down as quickly as possible in order to prevent this patient from bleeding to death. Because statistically, the majority of these patients will actually die in the pre-hospital phase. Um, you also need to get, uh, if you're examining this patient, um, you need to get down and have a quick look at the perineum. Um, any blood from the uh, urethra or from the, um, the anus uh, is an indicator for an open fracture, and the mortality for the open fractures is much more serious, about 50 or 60 percent, depending on who you read. Um, so, really, uh, the key thing is to get it on quickly. A nice take home from this is that. According to the Eastern Association of Surgeons of Trauma, who released their, their guidelines in 2011, these things work as well, if not better, than the external fixators that the orthopedic surgeons can put on. You don't need to use a fancy pelvic splint. This is the um, uh, clinical practice guideline from the Army Service of New South Wales. They advocate that their uh, paramedics use just sheets. The only thing they say to you about pre-hospitally 
it is a kind of a, a complicated um, device to put on and also to maintain, particularly if you're moving patients from uh, one transport vehicle to another, perhaps. So probably, um, I would say that the safest thing to go with for pre-hospital folks is some kind of a commercial device that you can put in situ, that you can leave it there and you know it's doing its job. Um, and as I said, you want to get it on early as quickly as possible. So this is a nice little device that we've actually had on a helicopter for about the last year or so. Um, and it's the Lewis pelvic applicator. So it allows us to actually apply the pelvic stent while the person is still in the car. Because if you think about it, the way that most car seats, certainly for front, pass front seat passengers, are designed with the sort of bolster cushions that are going to support the pelvis to a certain degree. And once you release the patient from that entrapment, then that support is no longer there. Um, and then they can start to hemorrhage pretty significantly. So um, definitely get your device on early. Um, and as I said, there are a number of them out there. You can have a look at the, the different ones that different manufacturers have um, in, in during the breaks. There's also a couple of nice uh, little techniques um, that other people have for further reducing these fractures. Uh, this is a, um, a couple that are on uh, emergency medicine websites. Um, uh, this also works very well for those patients with those uh, fractured um, uh, fractured neck femur. So how are we going to move this patient? Well, traditionally we've always strapped our patients to long spinal boards, which is probably detrimental, particularly when you consider that the amount of uh, rotational um, uh, movement that we have to employ in order to get them safely onto that board uh, can be up to 510 degrees. And each degree of rotation is another opportunity to disrupt one of those um, clots that's forming. So probably um, our better option is to use a, a scoop stretcher which we can place a lot more easily, and then once we get to the hospital, there's a lot less uh, rotation involved to actually remove it. Uh, just two final documents I, I draw your attention to, both uh, consensus statements from Faculty of Rehospital Care, the Royal College Service of Edinburgh, appeared in the Emergency Medical Journal last uh, December. Um, and the first one is uh, pelvic compression devices, and the second one that I'll draw your attention to is um, their consensus document on minimal handling. Um, and uh, another nice little piece of information that came out just for us uh, was published in the AM, AM, Air Medical Journal uh, last March. Uh, was uh, done by these guys, uh, some uh, flight physicians in Italy, who said that really, you know, as far as the transport modality, helicopter transport is probably a safer way to go for these patients in that it actually produces less movement um, and less vibration. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, some really take home points, uh, you know. Um, uh, the other great thing about having these stints in situ is that they do act as a sort of marker for the emergency department staff, that they can see that this patient needs to be handled carefully and uh, just to employ uh, or to make sure that they leave them in situ um, while they're doing their, their x-rays. So this is actually um, the x-ray from our patient, uh, from our case study. You can see they had a, a very significant lateral compression fracture 3, and you can see the buckle from the, the pelvic binder in, in uh, you can say to me that, well, you know, it doesn't look really anatomically correct. Fine, we're not orthopedic surgeons. We're not trying to affect an orthopedic repair. What we're trying to do is we're trying to compress the, uh, or compress the pelvis enough to stop the significant bleeding. So thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.